Let's take a look at the specifics of the stress response, and I want to group them into two categories. Firstly, anxiety and other difficult or painful emotions. And secondly, fatigue or energy and motivation problems or other issues that are a little more physical in nature. So these are the two classes of stress-related problems that the course is aiming to address. I'll say more about these. Anxiety is the main emotion associated with stress. It takes many forms ranging from quite specific and context-dependent fears such as phobias to social anxiety and generalised anxiety. In the course we're going to be looking at the specific and individual nature of anxiety. Panic is an extreme form of anxiety, often having quite clear physical or bodily expressions such as hyperventilation, which we'll go into in some detail later in the course. Then worrying, which is thinking driven by anxiety, thinking about all the things that could go wrong or have gone wrong, or obsessing, thinking over and over the same thoughts. Very often people experience stress not as actual fear or as actual worry, but just as an agitated, busy mind, racing thoughts, inability to switch off. Often you're physically quite restless too. Related to this is insomnia. You can't settle down to sleep because your mind is still buzzing. Then there's anger and irritability, short temper, frustration, resentment, impatience. Then connected to emotions are cravings and addictions or habit problems such as smoking and of course a really common one, appetite control and weight management. The other category is fatigue and low energy which again is so common these days. Related problems include low motivation or drive and procrastination. Brain fog which is poor concentration and focus, inability to think clearly and to hold things in mind low mood and low self-esteem. And then there are a lot of stress-related physical symptoms such as headaches and IBS. In fact, almost any physical health condition can be made worse by stress. Often such low-grade health problems are accompanied by fatigue, though not necessarily. Fatigue is an interesting state because in some ways it's a physical state, but it's also partly emotional in nature, in the sense that it's an experience that's created by the brain in response to both physical and mental triggers. What distinguishes this second class of problem is that they're more pervasive, less dependent on some particular trigger, and also longer lasting. They're probably connected to more deep-rooted physical changes, and it's likely that they're connected to a later stage of the stress response. Collectively, we might call these symptoms burnout, which tends to be the result of stress lasting months, or maybe even years. Probably the most definitive characteristics of burnout are fatigue, maybe insomnia of the early waking variety, and lack of resilience. Little things can upset you inordinately, or leave you exhausted for hours or days afterwards. Now let's look at what the goals are. I like to express it in terms of developing resources, internal resources or skills. Things like stress resilience, which is the ability to cope with stressful events and their consequences, and to recover quickly and easily. I prefer this expression to stress reduction because the goal is not really to avoid stress or to prevent the stress response, which isn't really realistic but rather to use the energy that's in the stress response productively. Emotional well-being, having a positive mood for at least most of the time. And having abundant willpower, motivation and energy. These are three high-level resources, things that everyone would sign up for. We can drop down a level and get a more detailed view of what these resources specifically entail and list things like distress tolerance, or the ability to sit with or hold painful feelings without feeling overwhelmed, not getting reactive, not getting sucked in. There are lots of experiences we need to be tolerant of, such as anxiety or pain or cravings or uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen, or things not going to plan, not getting what you expected or what you wanted. What they all share is that they make us feel uncomfortable, so that we want to get away from the experience. So more generally, being able to hold uncomfortable feelings 
is a really valuable resource. Another is the ability to quieten the mind, settle it down, still any agitation and restlessness, and also calm the body when it's over-aroused. If you can do that, you've got a much better chance of being able to focus clearly and think lucidly, creatively and productively, so what you would call optimal cognitive performance. The ability to enter a state of relaxed focus is just about universally useful. It's what we need in the face of stress. Who doesn't need it? Who doesn't need it to be at your best at work, whatever your job may be? Not just in work, but also leisure activities, from golf and other sports, to arts and crafts, and even just simply reading or watching TV. And then the ability to access positive emotions, specific positive emotions like gratitude and appreciation, hope or interest. It's not just about getting rid of negative emotions like anxiety and irritability. Accessing positivity is an aspect of resilience, or the ability to quickly and easily recover from knockbacks. In a sense, these lower level resources are like component skills for the high level resources that I listed in the last slide. Also for more specific goals, for example, suppose you want to lose weight, that's going to take motivation and willpower. But what does that actually mean? Well, at some point, you're going to experience cravings or impulses to eat inappropriately. You have to be able to tolerate these feelings. It's not realistic to think that they won't arise or that you'll just be able to get rid of them. Rather, you have to let them dissipate naturally. At the same time, it helps to be able to access positive motivation, hope and anticipation of good feelings to come much further ahead. Now, earlier I mentioned mind-body skills, or the ability to regulate your body responses or your physiology. I hope that you can begin to at least get a glimpse of how such mind-body skills are involved at this lower level. For example, if you want to let go of cravings, you have to be able to let go of the arousal or activation that cravings tend to produce in the body. There are five modules, and the first two are preparatory, while the third, fourth and fifth are the heart of the course when we get into biofeedback practice. Module one is about setting up the project. I think it's good to think in those terms. You have certain outcomes that you want to achieve that are individual to you, at least to some extent. And the clearer you are about what your outcomes are, the better your chance of actually getting there. And goals have to be realistic. Often it's chasing impossible goals that actually constitutes the real problem. So you need to be clear on what your personal goals are, and we need to ensure that they're realistic and that the course is relevant to them. So that's what we're going to cover in Module 1, and we'll also present some models that will help you understand how to work with biofeedback. Module 2 looks at mindfulness. As I've already said, mindfulness is a kind of mind training, and there are lots of people offering courses in mindfulness, usually lasting six or eight weeks. Now, I'm not going to cover mindfulness in the same way. In particular, we're not going to be doing much in the way of straight mindfulness practice. Rather, we're going to bring some elements of mindfulness into our biofeedback training. In Module 3, we finally get to biofeedback, and we'll start with EMG, or muscle tension biofeedback. EMG is a good place to start because it's relatively easy to make sense of and make progress with. It's a way of getting to know what biofeedback is all about, and at the same time giving us a good foundation to build on in terms of breathing training. In Module 4 we get on to capnometry. As I said, capnometry is about breathing chemistry, which is probably the most important element of optimal breathing because it's about ensuring optimal delivery of oxygen to brain cells. And paradoxically, the biggest obstacle to that is overbreathing or hyperventilation. And I'll be explaining why that is. Now, if you think that you don't overbreathe, I'd suggest that you hold your judgment a while because most overbreathing is a matter of degree, and most mild overbreathers have no idea that they're actually doing so. Even if you're not actually an overbreather, you can still benefit from learning to move from normal or everyday breathing into truly optimal breathing. Module 5 focuses on HRV biofeedback. It's still focused on breathing and it builds upon what we've learned, but it adds a new dimension to the feedback. You may have heard of heart rate variability because it's become well known as an assessment tool. It's a biomarker for various aspects of performance. 
In HRV training, we're interested in a particular pattern of variation called heart rate coherence. We'll be looking at what that is and why it's a useful thing to train.